we're going to talk about a British politician named Liz Struss. And she's the current Prime Minister of, of the United Kingdom. And she's in the headlines lately because she's made a couple of decisions about their economy. And she's had to kind of fishtail her way back the other direction with them. And she's getting a little bit of heat for that. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, I think that's about all there is really to say. This is BBC Political Joe, I believe. And uh, if I can remember the interviewer's name, Mark, you may. Um, that's I'll Laura Kunzberg. Laura Kunzberg, who, who has spent a lot of time in front of cameras in the U.S. and there. She was involved in the U.S. here as well. Um, and this was around decisions around cutting the top tax bracket and around social spending and those things. How many people voted for your plan? What do you mean by that? Sorry. Well, you've set out a significant change of direction mm -hmm. from the Conservative government that you were being part of for many, many years. But how many people voted for you to do that? Well, people in 2019 who voted Conservative voted for a successful country where we are levelling up all parts of the country and where we're driving growth, enterprise and opportunity. Now, any government has to deal with the circumstances it faces. And we face this situation of, you know, which was, was unforeseen, huge energy costs, rising inflation due to the war in Ukraine and the aftermath but you, of COVID. But you know, but you know very well, Prime Minister, that there are a delivering. small number of people in the Conservative Party, who tens of thousands rather than the whole country, voted for you in the leadership contest, perfectly legitimately. But do you fear that you have put the country on a path that it didn't ask for because you believe very strongly that it will lead to growth. Finally, what happens if it doesn't work? Well, what people voted for in 2019, when they voted for con Conservative, sometimes for the first time <coughs> in many years, is they voted for a different future. They voted for investment into their towns and cities. They voted for higher wages. They voted for economic growth. And that is what our plan will deliver. She's British, so are you, Mark, so why don't you go first? Yeah, okay, so uh, what do you mean by that, she says, and she leans in uh, after taking some time to kind of compute where that might be coming from and what she's going to do with that question. So already on a little bit of a back foot there, but leans into it. This is a great interview in terms of all what I would call the moderator gestures that are going on here. These are the gestures in my book that decide who's in charge, who's talking, who should talk next, who's going to be shut down and suppressed or who we want an answer from so lots of that uh, going on here but from trust at the moment the the her moderators uh, seem to be asymmetrical which is never a good sign and, and some of them are just kind of hanging on in there it's like a rock climber with just you know one hand kind of just just hanging on to it later on we will see some some bigger beach balls there and and some little melons going on as well but so so look out for that one um eyebrow raise there on um, on uh, unforeseen uh, elements. So, so looking for approval on the idea of, look, we just didn't know how this was going to turn out. Nobody can tell what macroeconomics are going to go on. So, so don't you know punish me too much around this. I want you to pay attention to the breathing rate in this. It's it's relatively relaxed and slow at the moment. That's going to change in a few videos' time. So just hang on there. Um, verbally what's going on here we've got uh, successful and level up and a different future successful level up different future all of those things completely unmeasurable which is a good thing as a politician if you can talk in unmeasurables it, it nobody can go well hang on we're, we're not we're not more successful or we didn't really level up or the future isn't very very different than it was before it's hard to measure so they're good things to put forward to a to a nation and, and, a, and a public because after a hundred days of your of, of office nobody can say you didn't really level up did you because you can go well we didn't really set the parameters of of leveling up it was the future isn't very very different now well you know we we got some of the differences we never really set the differences so look nice start here uh, a, a, a very strong adversary here in uh, Laura Kunzberg. Uh, she is um, the first female political editor at the BBC. So she's, she's quite a formidable player. Uh, Greg, what have you got on this one? 
Yeah, and Mark, thanks for remembering her name. I looked her up today to find out where she was from because I heard that nice Scottish R in there. I figured she was from somewhere. She's and I read that she went to university in Edinburgh and was originally from Glasgow. So yeah, mm-hmm. and from a fam- a family. But one of the more interesting things that happens in this, yes, there's clearly no love lost between these two people. You can't miss the body language right out of the gate. But she restru- she asked a poor question right up front. She says, Who voted for you basically, or did your constituents vote for this? And she allows her the opportunity to restructure the question. The PM says, what do you mean by that? Well, there's your chance to go back and say, did members of your of your cabinet or your any other of your party do it? But she doesn't. She just lets her go. So she gets the chance to restructure the question the way she wants. And you're right, Mark. She leans way in and she throws away those words. What do you mean by that? She's leaning in for clarification. And her toes on that aim foot rise when she says it. So I think there's altercation already between these two, and she knows that she's going to use this information some way. Remember, the power of a question is everything. If you ask a leading question, if you ask a bad question, it should be to set up your next one. Then as she gets the runway to say whatever she wants, she launches into prepared delivery. Markets dead on. I mean, this is the same thing we hear our politicians in the U.S. do all the time. They've got canned stuff that comes out at a different cadence than the stuff when they're forced to answer questions. Her blink rate goes through the roof. And I'm, I believe by watching her, part of the reason is her she blinks in part to punctuate what she's thinking as an illustrator. And then you add the other blinking to it, you'll see a whole lot there. When we say an illustrator, it's the way I use my body to punctuate what I think. She also illustrates very clearly with her head nods and her forehead comes up and she edits as she speaks when she's talking about the situation we face. My, my other favorite thing she does, Mark, you talk, you call them not regulators. What do you call them? Yeah, moderators, same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah so regulators in the US, it's a way we control conversation. She tries to bat down the, the interviewer. It doesn't work. And then the interviewer uses regulators aggressively back at her with that hands down as an emphatic as well as an illustrator. And there's little, very little eye contact from this interviewer until she says, what happens if it doesn't work? Her face contorts a bit in contempt and she eye blocks. Yeah, this is a real good start to this is not going the way you wanted it to go when you first show up. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so the... The hesitancy here starts to indicate some apprehension, I think. There's some postural movement. So like a sitting up, kind of moving back in a way. There's a foot movement here that you were you were talking about, uh, Mark. And there's pacifying gestures, which is kind of like a, a self-soothing behavior. So that all indicates the stress that she's under. The interviewer does a great tactic here that you might have missed. She's facing away while interrupting. So my, my whole body's facing away and interrupting. So uh, even if it's to look at your notes, this prevents the other person from non-verbally communicating that they wish to continue speaking. So this seriously increases the likelihood of them just giving up and and going along with it. So all situations are kind of outside her control are just wiped away. You can see these hand gestures wiping away everything that's outside of her control with every single mention. And watch in just a moment the different hand movements that she uses to talk about the good things. And I want you to see if you can spot them. They're very different if you're a subscriber, you know what this means. I'm going to leave it out here. One of the few times I'm going to do it, type it in the comments, how this behavior no- alone, knowing the good things and the bad things, hand gestures, gives us a perfect recipe to influence this person's thinking in the future of this interview. So the interviewer also uh, is is not turned toward the politician here, not turned toward her at all. She's almost facing away. This could be unconscious behavior, but I really doubt it. If it's unconscious, it suggests that there's a lot of disagreement to begin with, which means the interview is uh, maybe doomed from the beginning. The person facing uh, inward more, this is called ventral orientation, the sciency name, if you want to sound fancy, how we're facing a person or facing away. The, the, the person facing inward more is typically more invested in the outcome of the situation. So you can look around a restaurant, an airport, and use just this one thing. Who's facing inward toward the other person more? They're probably more invested. 
If the interviewer planned this, I think it's quite possibly signaling authority on purpose, and you can see that it's actually working. Scott, what do you got? All right. <laughs> you guys pretty much covered everything, but I think you're right. Right out of the gate, it gets aggressive. And I think she's coming on. It's almost like she's mad at her and said, sit down over here. I want to talk to you about this. That's the vibe you get when it first starts. Um, and after that first question, she's, we're seeing adapters everywhere, but they're really, really subtle. We're seeing very subtle adapting going on there from Liz. I'll call, I'll call her Liz, I guess. Or she, what do I call her? Prime Minister Trust? No, you can just call her Liz. Okay, I'll just call her Liz. You have permission uh, from and, Mark. <laughs> oh, there you go. Got one on my team. So she seems, and she seems composed, um, but illustrators aren't timed correctly. They're really, really close. When she starts putting her hand out and doing these things, they're really tight, but they're not timed correctly. It doesn't mean she's being deceptive. That just means that she's got a lot on her mind, lots going on up there. So she, as as this aggression's coming in, she's going through that as she's answering. And she starts giving this Kamala Harris-esque answer that sounds like to me like it really doesn't mean much there's a lot of being said but really not a lot of punch to it you know and so as, as she goes along and keeps talking she gets interrupted and she lets the interviewer interrupt her so she lets her rescue her from this this out of this letter talk and just keep going because it made no sense she rescues her from this this horrible speech she's given this this conglomeration of thoughts and it just it just sounds like I, I get to watch my mouth on this, but I, it just it just doesn't sound like it makes makes much sense at all to me. Um, then she's throwing the, this that really strong regulator, trying to calm her, not calm her down, but but coming on to keep her, try to keep her quiet as she's trying to talk. It just seems like a big fuss back and forth. Um, yeah, I, because she feels threatened. That's all. I'm trying to think of things that you guys didn't cover. That's all I got really. So, all right, we good? Yeah. All right. That is what our plan will deliver. Are you absolutely committed to abolishing the 45 pence tax rate for the wealthiest people in the country? Yes. And it is part, Laura, it is part of an overall package mm -hmm. of making our tax system simpler and lower. But I think it's worth noting in the package we announced, the vast majority of that package is the energy package. And we talked a lot about that. But it's I the to, energy I package, it's national insurance. The 45p rate actually raises very little and makes our tax system you know, more complicated. And we, we need to move away. We need to move away from the idea that everything is about how we re redistribute resources. We also need to make sure we have got a tax system that's competitive internationally and it's helping us bring in the investment get people into work and you and you get that people very wanting again, to the economy get is up going the career ladder you've, you've made that, that very clear can i can i ask you greg what do you got she starts right out of the gate with this are you absolutely she's cadence shifted intentionally to put her on notice and as she goes through it she's asking her hard question are you removing this top tax bracket Part of the population is going to like that. Part of the population is not going to, and she knows it. So what does she do? She just says, all right, I'm coming right out of the gate. And I just she goes right at it and then immediately puts her hands up to start regulating. Now, she does something awkward. Scott, you talked about her being wooden. I think it's weirder than wooden. She tries to regulate with her hands at the same time she is illustrating with her hands. And she looks like Phantom of the Opera because she's doing this, you know, moving her hands like this. Mark, she could learn, open. She, she could learn from the truth plane how to be more effective with this communication. But instead, she's doing kind of this phantom of the opera thing. And it looks wooden and awkward and hard to like. You can suppress by, uh, by doing that. You can illustrate by using your hand this way and go, hold on one minute. And certain parts of it are cultural. Mark, I'm sure you'll point out the ones that are cultural and what we shouldn't do or should do. Um, the interviewer is congruent in her last message. And I'm just going to take this and, and you can go from there. And that is, I don't want to hear any more about that. Because she does regulators, starts controlling her conversation, talks over and breaks eye contact. That's congruent messaging for I'm done listening to whatever you're saying. So this is not a friendly interchange. This is a pretty aggressive one. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I totally agree. So suppressive gestures right at the start there. 
just as you say, to regulate, to moderate, but she's she then starts to bat on along to that and illustrate along to that, and it's just too much. The interviewer starts coming in and trying to suppress her back. What I would like her to be doing is is moving things across and along. She does try to move on to. Um, to energy, but she fails to wipe anything. She fails to cut into it and push stuff aside and create these bigger images where she could stay clear and then move into those bigger open gestures that are going to win a more authority and not have this sense of, of, of battle that's going on because we got two suppressors battling each other at the moment no clear winner at this point chase what do you got on this one yeah uh, i agree the explanation here or this answer starts with two big these big stop gestures and a postural retreat which is when we lean back in a way which indicates submission and maybe a desire to prevent some interruption so uh, guys, hold on just a second. I'll, I'll finish in just a second. And this is me stopping an interruption or stopping someone from interrupting me. And this stop gesture in other contexts means something different. But here it's social. So her blink rate seems to spike while talking about the benefits of this tax program, specifically around making taxes simpler and lower and blink rate is an indicator of stress. If our blink rate goes up, it indicates a spike in stress. Lower blink rate is sometimes relaxation, but almost always focus. So this interviewer has no interest whatsoever in allowing uh, the prime minister to speak uh, on her own. And she's being kind of steamrolled a little bit, although she's doing the traditional political answer. I get a I get a pinpointed answer. I'm going to reach in and I'm going to zoom out on Google Maps or on the, on this map. They're they're looking at this city. I'm going to zoom out and scoot over to the exact thing that I want to talk about as soon as possible. She's just forgetting to scoot over. She's just zooming out. <laughs> and that's I think to your point, Mark. She's just not getting getting across very well. Scott. All right. I think she's using those hands to regulate her, but I think it's it's an aggressive move on her part trying to re regain control at that point. I think she's trying to, she's no, so she thinks no matter what happens, she's not going to come across this because this is such a big deal, me doing this. I think that's her her attempt to to to, to hold. Obviously, it's a regulator. And she's trying to 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 stand her ground, but I think she's to her that's really aggressive. I think that's the way it looked like to me. Um, and I think the interviewer. I think you're right. I think the interviewer's emotions got a little bit. I think she's a little bit heated there, a little bit heated up. And so she's starting to not be unprofessional, but she's getting right on the edge of that there, man, coming out a little bit strong with, with, with her, with her questioning, busting in, not letting her talk. I, I just, I, I don't know. I think you should, you should at least let him talk. Liz's blink rate still a little bit high. Her cadence though is about the same. Her volume is about the same at this point, and her tone is about the same. Everything's pretty much stayed level. She's trying to stay composed. She's the leader. She's the one in charge, and that's what you're supposed to do. And I think she's doing a great job of doing that, but I think she's trying to gain control at this point. And even though she's doing all this stuff, she's she's staying at that you know 100,000 feet of trying to explain what's happening, which really isn't saying. She's just lobbing these ideas and things in <clears throat> excuse me without really saying much without pinpointing things so you're right chase it's odd she pinpoints nothing as she pinpoints so it's it's really it's really odd it's really, this thing is i think on both their parts it's a little bit out of control you the economy get is going up your priority. you've, you've made that, that very clear can i can i ask you premise did you discuss scrapping the top rate with your whole cabinet no Do no we think... didn't it was a decision that um, the Chancellor made. Do you think that that is the right way to go about developing what has become a very controversial policy? You say it doesn't cost that much money, but it's a big decision, isn't it? If you'd well, been we, in Boris Johnson's we, cabinet and we, he had announced have, something like that without Laura, asking we you, have how would committed, you have felt? We have committed, and I committed during the leadership campaign, to make our system more competitive to lower our taxes and to simplify our taxes. And I think that's fundamentally important. Now, when budgets are developed, they are developed in a very confidential way. 
you know, they're very market sensitive. Of course, the cabinet is briefed, but it is never the case uh, on budgets that they are a something that is created by the whole cabinet. The principles, though. Now, if you don't know who we are, we're the behavior panel. And I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, Body Language Tactics, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7, a little bit like Elizabeth Truss. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on influence, persuasion, and behavior profiling. I teach people to do that in my app and all over the world. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, working on another one, and put together this number one body language tactics.com course with Scott. I spend most of my time around business. All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I just have one big thing here since this is not uh, politically centered, this entire conversation here. But right during this controversial policy moment, the moment controversial policy is mentioned, anger instantaneously appears on the forehead. The brows coming together and these two little lines forming right here. That's what we see when somebody gets angry. And I want to illustrate that nobody, even if you get become an elected official, you have one of the best poker faces on planet Earth. But that does not give you some vaccination against being a human being. So when we talk about body language and stuff, that exactly is what we're talking about, that nobody's really immune, including ourselves. When somebody is at a seminar or something like, oh, Chase, I noticed your blink rate increase. I'm like, yeah, I'm a human. I just try to remind you of that, that even the prime minister is not immune to this anger and displays of uh, emotion like this. Neither is anybody else. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, you know, Chase, I always say that we're like Jane Goodall among the chimps, except we're also chimps. So we're affected by everything going on around us. When we watch other people it has an impact on us because of all those mirror neurons and everything in our head, we see things that we another chimp would not see in us. So a couple of things, at, that's at 17 seconds in the video, by the way, the thing you're talking about, I call it, it looks like an angry mother-in-law. Yeah, that tightening of the eyes and all that, you can't miss. If you look at it very, very carefully, you'll see her blink rate slows, which she blinks an awful lot. The prime minister blinks an awful lot. It slows and then she eye blocks at developing. Her eyes narrow and then they her brow drops at controversy. That's pretty powerful considering everything else we've seen. Then she's back to prepared material. Now, let me give you a pointer. Anytime you hear the word did, will, are, can, have, those are leading questions. And it's okay if you want to use a leading question to direct conversation. We always say in interrogation, they're not good because it gives a person option to say yes or no. And she knows what it's going to be. And she goes and asks, did you consult? She goes after her and uses that leading question as a control mechanism. When you hear that, you can have a defense against it. I've done a lot of TV news and I've done on both sides of the spectrum. And they all, all want me to say, hey, this guy's an idiot. I usually talk about body language in every side. No matter which extreme you're in, they're gonna ask you to go after the guy. What you do is you take that moment when they ask you did, will, are. Well, you, what you have to consider is you have to have filler words and Mark, you teach your guys that all the time, I'm sure. But you gotta take control of the conversation, redirect it, put it into your arena, change fields and work from there. Pay attention, that's for you. When somebody asks you a question that's going to box you into a corner, take that opportunity to, to pivot, not chaff and redirect, but to pivot to a new topic or a new way to talk about it. Scott, what do you got? All right. In my opinion, I think this is where Liz should have gotten up and left because she's not being treated like a prime minister with respect that she should be treated with as a prime minister. Not that I agree with anything she has to say, not that anybody else does, but you don't do that. The people do these days, but she, she should have gotten up and left. That would have been the thing to do, I think, at that point. And she tries that, that combination illustrator and regulator at the same time, and it just doesn't work because she's not aggressive enough with it, and she lets the interviewer talk over. I think if she had been more aggressive in this, or just gotten up and said, you know, this isn't, this isn't, I'm not about this. I don't want to, I'm not doing this. That would have been a whole, I think she would have looked a lot better at the end than she does at this point. That's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yep. So, uh, look, breathing rate is now right up 
on this. This is a, an aggressive question. And if you look at that little um, pin that she's wearing of the uh, UK flag there and Ukraine flag, uh, you can see that now moving at a whole different rate. Go back to our first video, super relaxed. This one, now breathing rate is up. So she's in trouble. However, she does deploy countermeasures to this. So she does have a big open gesture. She kind of holds this beach ball there and she does chunk up to a bigger concept. So that's a really good idea. Hold a big beach ball and now start thinking about bigger concepts. However, she then brings it down to some kind of small melon over here and she's gone back to detail about budgets which was what she was trying to avoid with this bigger concept she goes down to this melon of budgets she then shifts it over somewhere else now she doesn't know what to do with it and now she's kind of she's she's kind of pushing flour together she's she's baking bread somewhere and she's lost it completely so if she had have just stuck with that beach ball there and the higher concept and just as chase has been saying managed to fly up at 10,000 feet and then drop in with some kind of slice gesture into exactly what she wants the British people to know that would have been a good move she's left kind of floating around somewhere on this one and it's not going to get a lot uh, better for her. Sure, we do a better job of laying the ground. What many of your MPs fear is because interest rates are on the way up, because the cost of government borrowing is going up as we've seen this morning, the fear is that the consequences will be more taxpayers' cash will be eaten up, there'll be less money for everything else. Are you going to cut public spending? I don't accept that argument and I will do what I can to win the hearts and minds uh, of my colleagues across the Conservative Party because I believe we need to grow the size of the pie. That's fundamentally what we need to do as a country and we've had two decades of relatively low growth. But how, how, what, I'm answering your question, Laura. What low growth means, mm. low growth means people aren't able to get the jobs they deserve. No, no, my they mean was lower wages and they mean le less minister. money no, for public services. They mean but are so you this is why growth is so spending. important. But and that is at the core of our economic policy. But are policy. you going to cut public... Right, I'll go first on this one. Uh, when Liz says, I don't accept that, she goes into total politician mode. After that, she looks at what she thinks is the camera that's that's on her, and it's not. And she even puts out her, her, her fist with a thumb on top of it to do that and gives what I don't, I'm not familiar with, with her political style and everything, but I would assume that's the same face she would use every time on TV, every time she's she's on the at the podium and pitching something or talking about voting for her, talking about something political. I think that's the face she probably probably makes and i think it's odd that she's answering to the camera and not that she should be she should be talking to the interviewer so it makes it look even weirder she's like trying to go like i'm shoving you off and talking to the people and yeah, just it, I, don't, I don't think it worked her cadence speeds up a little bit her volume gets a little bit louder her tone changes it gets a little bit higher she's getting worked up at this point so i think the the tactics of the interviewer are working and i don't think that liz understands how to how to take control of something because she's trying her best, I think, but it's not really working out for her. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, if somebody tries these tactics with you and you're in a conversation like facing away from you on purpose or interrupting you, bring it up into the light, bring it up. You say, yeah, I realize this can be persuasive to some people and make it look like you're in a position of authority. Point the situation out. In some instances, that is a great idea to do because it makes people very conscious of it. So you're not having an unconscious influence because you forced it into the conscious part of it. Right when she says the hearts and minds, she shifts to almost a caricature of a politician, mixing the kind of the Bill Clinton hand gesture here and the Nixon uh, knife hand right there, and then smiling at what I assume is some camera she thinks is the live one, uh, Scott, like you were saying there. And watching this whole interview is almost meaningless. Mark, you were saying while we were in between uh, recordings here, uh, there's no questions that are answered. The interviewer has such a hard line narrative that she can't let uh, Liz finish a single thought. So one person has a narrative that that is like made of titanium and the other person is unable to answer or doesn't answer the questions directly in the first place. Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, so this goes somewhere fantastic for me, which is uh, into classic Boris Johnson style metaphors. So she talks about we're gonna uh, we're gonna grow the size of the pie. So, and that's that's what Boris would do all the time, talking food metaphors. You remember uh, he had he had um, Brexit being oven ready. He had the idea of you can have your cake and eat it. So this is this is a classic for 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 Boris, a classic for English politics on the whole. If you can use a food metaphor, the British public will go, oh yeah, food, oh pie, yeah. Well, we want a pie. If there's a bigger pie in it, yeah. I mean, who who can deny that a bigger pie is better than a smaller pie? So she's done a very very skillful political move there by talking about pies, very British food. It's it's very similar to her legendary cheese rant of 2014 at the Conservative Party conference, where she, she waxed lyrical about how most of British cheese was coming from ab abroad, not, not bringing into account the fact that the French make excessively good cheese, and so do the Dutch, for example. And of course, if you're in Britain and you like cheese, well, you're going to get some cheese from Europe because there's exceptionally good cheese from Europe as well. Anyway, um, then she goes into growth is so important and she wants to stress the core of the economic policy. So she's now moved into the ideas of growth metaphors, almost apple tree uh, metaphors. Again, great thing to go in British British politics is talk, talk about classically British things like apple trees and apples and, and cores and things growing because the British love their, their gardens and their countryside. So, um, so a great maneuver from her because she is on the back foot, but she's going for some metaphors and some ideas that the British public can't help but but listen to and be positive towards. Although it's only a countermeasure, it's not going to do her any any good uh, in the end. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, it's clear. She does, however, this time take over the leading question. Remember, when you have a narrative you're trying to get, you're going to ask, are, did, will, have, can't. All you're after is getting that person to admit. And then it doesn't matter how much backpedaling or, or, or duck paddling they do. They still look like they're they're reinforcing your message. She doesn't. She She takes control of it and then restates what she was trying to say and moves to a polite version of a chat, very English, not just a bunch of spewing like most American politicians, but very British, very contained. But she does chaff and redirect. She's trying to redirect. And then she, I, I couldn't tell her it's a camera or there might be two people over there she was turning to look at, but she's talking to an audience, an intended audience, whether it's two actual people or they represent someone else or there's a camera, can't tell. But she turns that way and respiration increases just slightly as this interviewer is not going to have it and starts trying to step on her again and control and regulate, then she says, I am answering. And when she does, her forehead comes up and her upper lids rise. That's aggression. And she's saying, look, I got control of this. And then here we go again. The, the, this interviewer doesn't want to hear it and restates her question and starts pushing. So I think all of this aside, Mark, to your point, she's trying to score a point with people out there, but so is this interviewer because they're different audiences. It's what we see all the time in, in any political situation you're in, two different parties and they're going after it. Core of our economic policy. But are policy. you going to cut public spending? Because one of your cabinet ministers said this week, Simon Clark, he said, we look at a state which is extremely large and we have to look at how we can make sure that is in full alignment with a lower tax economy. Now, what does that mean? Well, I, I believe in getting value for money for the taxpayer. That's very important to me. And the way that we are going to improve our economy is, for example, get, helping more people get into work. That saves the government money, but it also contributes to the economy. So what we will have is a long-term plan for reform, help more people get into work, make our economy more productive, get better value for money for the taxpayer. But Prime Minister, I've asked you if you're going to cut spending on public services. Are you going to cut spending on public services? Well, what I'm going to do is make sure we get value for money for the taxpayer. But I am very, very committed to making sure we've got excellent frontline public services. And I'm not going to go into what the Chancellor will announce in his medium term fiscal plan. At the end of November. He's going to announce that very shortly. It will come together with an OBR forecast. That's very important. But hang on. But, but my approach mm -hmm. is to 
help people get through this very difficult winter and mm -hmm. it's a problem we're facing internationally. But Karen, so this through, is quite a straightforward <laughs> question. Support. Are you going to cut public spending on public services? And I've asked you a couple of times and, and normally I'm gonna, the fact I'm that you won't answer it directly suggests oh. that you're going to. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't because I can't exactly set out what is going to be in this plan. What I can promise is we're going to reduce debt as a proportion of GDP. By when? But the point in the medium term, What's and we will set out term? exactly what that is when we put out the medium term fiscal plan. But the point about reducing debt as a proportion of GDP is it all depends on how fast the economy is growing. Mm -hmm. And the key thing is to get the economy growing faster so the pie is bigger and we can afford more money for great public services. All right, Greg, what do you got? Let me, let me point out something we usually say. We're Switzerland. We don't have an opinion in this. I candidly don't know enough about British politics to have an opinion. But I can tell you something interesting here. I, before it's over, I'll say I can answer for her probably based on her body language as to whether she's going to cut social spending. Um, the interviewer squints in the beginning at that lower tax economy. You see her squint. And then she does the finer point as she asks the question, the Trump thing, where she puts her fingers together and she's pushing her. And she does something artful. We talk about interviewers using artful technique, she uses naivete, which is a, an elicitation technique. So what does that mean? I want you to educate me. You're going to tell me details. Then she starts down it. And here the, the PM becomes very emphatic with her head nod at value to the taxpayer. It reminds me of, if you remember Aaron Caffey, kill my parents. She did the, did the same thing, push her head forward and blink her eyes at the same time. Pretty powerful. Then she puts her palm up in a single-handed illustrator. She's feeling more comfortable now than doing this kind of wooden thing she was doing in the beginning. What I'm not going to do is let, and then you pay attention, she's not letting her use the same tools on her she's used before. She takes control of the question, and this is like politicians typically do in the news. Okay, you gave me the, the rope, I'm going to take it and run with it, and then you can reel me back in as you will. And Chase, you see her doing the Bill Clinton buggy whip hold. That they went away from doing this where they whip with a finger to carrying the buggy whip after Bill Clinton. That happened at the Monica Lewinsky scandal. If you want to go back and look at presidents, American presidents always did this before. The interesting piece, and this is why I said I can tell you what she thinks. I mean, you know, I can't read minds, but she shrinks, her body gets smaller, and her voice starts to fry, and her cadence shifts as she says, No, it doesn't. When she's saying, Does that mean you're going to cut? social spending. My guess is yes. Uh, Scott, what do you got? I think this is, is important in this interview because it shows, right, it's that point when, when I don't know a lot about boxing or anything, but the few boxing fights I've seen, when they're boxing, there comes a point in there where you know the guy's beat. You know when one guy's going to lose. She's lost every all of her air. She's lost her oomph at this point. Lost her fight because she's still swinging, still trying to fight. But she, like you were saying, Greg, she's gotten smaller, and all of her her illustrators have moved now to her left hand. Everything she was she was using her she was using her left hand dominantly, but she was also using her right hand. I think she's lost at this point. When she starts saying, um, when she asks her the question, and I think we know what the answer is. I think she's lost at that point because everything's over here. And I think when she's over here, she's trying to make stuff up. She's trying to come up with an answer because she goes back to the pie and all these things she talked about before. She's just reiterating everything up to that point. She's going back and going through stuff. Her, her breathing, her breath rate is, is high. Her, her blink rate is high. Like you were saying, Greg, her, her voice tone is up a little bit. And it's, it's getting higher. She's she's getting weaker at this point. So I think this is important. I think this is right before she gets gets knocked out in the fight, in other words. Um, and then once she gets, she tries to get back in her safe zone as a politician here as well, like you were saying. I think that's where she feels the safest because of where she is and what's gotten her there. So she keeps reverting back to that. And it's, it's not working. This, this other woman isn't going to let her have any room whatsoever. She's in there just wailing on her. Chase, what do you got? Let me try to explain this in a slightly different way that uh, I saw this morning when I was going through these videos. This hand out gesture you see here is common in interrogations when a guilty person is over explaining with lots of detail about all the wrong things, why they're innocent. That's why the hand stays out for so long. I felt like Mark doing that. <laughs> 
with my hand that close to the camera. But the detail spike, the detail spike is about everything except for what the question is about. This on its own suggests deception. We All of us here talk a lot about baseline clusters of behavior here. I'll go out on a limb here. These guys may disagree with me, but this is one situation where a single behavior can stand on its own. If there's a ton of detail about everything and zero detail about the actual question, I think that can stand on its own for deception. And you, it, this is where you ask for one of thing, one thing, and you get like none of it. The person dumps two hundred pounds of other things onto the table, except for the one thing that you asked for. So in this situation, the detail spike or detail mountain is around vague benefits and ideas, and the detail drop, which is maybe a detail valley, is around the specific question that was asked. This is likely deception. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so it is a real problem because, look, right at the start of it, she gets her hand involved and she starts to bring in the shoulder as well. And I'd say that is purposeful because she wants to give the impression of more action. Like, I'm, I'm putting my shoulder into this. We're going to have action. We're going to do some work around something. But you don't see the fingers moving. So there is no real detail around what this action will be. Now, the interviewer here has kind of trapped her because she is getting her into detail. And the problem with the detail of politics politics is number one even if you under if you know what details you're going to have if you know your policy it'll be hard to explain and you know your tactics it'll be hard to explain and the public won't quite get it i'm just, the public are smart but politics is really difficult so so even with the smartest public out there politics gets real politics real detail gets really boring and and inconsequential for most people so you never want to get involved in the detail well she's gone right into it even if she had some detail it would be a bad place to go in this situation she doesn't have any details around this because she has an ideology which is here's how the economy should should run and she has one idea which is knock off a few pence off the 45 pence but she's got one tactic one strategy which she cannot really talk about anymore so shall, now she is she is lost and i think that's why we got true blink rate up there. I think if you take out all the baselines that we've seen and all the other reasons why blink rate would be high because maybe she punctuates with it, I think it's extended quite a bit. She's really on the back foot. So um, oh, there's a nice bit from the interviewer where she pulls back her hair because she's just about to say, hey, your cabinet, your, your backbenchers, your party aren't aligned with this at all, which is murder to hear for a prime minister because it means you're probably going to get ousted very, very soon and plunge the country again into a situation where we don't know who the prime minister is. So, so that's that maneuver of, you may think I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, just a simple female but here comes the big hit and she hits her hard with that look trust in the end does come back to the pie very beautifully it's a surefire winner because suddenly you think as, a, as an english person yeah but we're gonna get a bigger pie and there's nothing wrong there's no downside to a bigger pie so let's let's hear her out a little bit longer sounds like we've got a pie in it for us Vera last night saying we're very grateful for the help we've had with our energy bills, but the effect of the mini budget or mortgages has meant hundreds more each month for us in mortgage payments. Your energy help may help millions of people. It may be generous. Well, it will help millions of people. But this cost is being wiped out for other, by other costs and increases in mortgages. What is the logic of giving people money to help with their energy bills if they then lose some of it because their mortgage goes through the roof because of the consequence of the decisions you've made? Well, I understand that people are worried and people are struggling. It's a very difficult time. We have to look at the mortgage issue what does that mean? separately, which is the Bank of England set interest rates, not the government. You know, this has rightly been independent since 1997. And we are facing a world in which interest rates are rising. In fact, our interest rates set by the Bank of England 
are lower than those of the Federal Reserve just briefly, and lower the, those but, other but countries. But do you acknowledge that some people are going to end up being worse off because their mortgage has gone up by more than their energy bill is being controlled by the government's freeze? Do you accept that? We want to do all we can to help homeowners. You know, we've, we've helped with stamp duty. That was one of the announcements in the mini budget. But ultimately, interest rates are a matter for the Independent Bank of England. And the Independent Bank of England do have to look at what is happening around the world. But we're asking about mortgages not interest rates, and mortgages are not set by the Bank of England. Mortgage but rates the, are a product of all sorts of factors, But the interest factors, rates including are a key the factor. Made. The interest rates are a key factor okay. in mortgage rates, okay. and those are set by the Bank of England, and they're somewhat dependent on the global market. So, Laura, we are not dealing with the issues we're dealing with in isolation. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with these issues in a world where there's a slowing global economy, and where there are rising interest rates, where there is huge inflation, mainly driven by energy caused by Vladimir Putin's war. And I, as Prime Minister and the Chancellor, have to deal with that in the way that we think will help people in Britain most get through these very, very difficult short-term circumstances, but put our country on the best long-term. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'll start off very simply. She swallows very hard a few times in here. Now, that could be a lot of reasons. It could be that all this is built up on her up to now, and it's not likely this question. Because here she can easily say, look, it's not me. This is tied to a whole bunch more stuff than my government. And it's actually probably one of the easier places for her to divert. And you notice it in her body language because she does good congruent body languaging for their separate issues. So you see that. But we also see when they hit that mortgage issue, she does an internal voice for the very first time. When we say internal voice, she drops down to her left to think about how do I navigate this? Because it doesn't matter whether or not she has any control over it or not. If she comes off and says, let them eat cake, she's done. So she has to be cautious what she says, but her con she's congruent in those, il those illustrators. And Mark, I don't know the politics of it at all, but when she says that the bank was rightly separated in 1997, there's a cadence shift and a massive tongue jut of disapproval. That's distaste. Don't know why. Don't know enough about the politics of, of you know conservative verses. But then she starts on this right hand about all the things in the world that have caused her problems and gets away from all the domestic issues. Interesting, because that's one, Mark, I'd love to hear the politics of. So I'll hand it to you. All right. Yeah. Well, let me give you the politics on 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 that one. And and, you, and you're right. Um, the, the breathing goes way higher on this convergence of energy and mortgages as well, because it's a perfect storm for a, for a for a massive amount of the British public there. And she tr tries to deflect off that there is there is she does not have control of interest rates, and she does that by saying interest. Um, uh, and that's rightly so. Well, in 1997, due to Tony Blair and Brown, the Chancellor. So this was a Labour uh, initiative, a Labour, her, her, Got it. <laughs> it's her opposition yep. who did this. And so, you know, what do you do in that kind of situation? Because it's like th they had the right idea. It's rightly so. And it, and but it shouldn't be rightly so because she should be opposed uh, to that in, in many, many ways. And so I think that's what the tongue jet, now is the tongue jet, jet complete disgust and distaste for this? I think it's the position she's in right now, which is, hang on, I'm caught in a bit of a spot here, basically espousing that, that Tony Blair did the right thing at this point. So I think that's what's going on uh, here. Um, you know, and there's a lot of stress now around this situation until she manages to bring it and regain some control with this hand here around macroeconomics. And there's just, you know, there's Putin's war and there's stuff we can't do anything uh, about, which may have some veracity uh, to it. And she feels more confident about. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, uh, that was educational. So thanks for that. Right at this kind of mortgage issue, there's a down left movement, which is internal dialogue, pushes the issue away with her hands and just talks about something else. So, Mark, you were on point about a little bit of this. Like she did one thing that that you suggested, maybe on accident. And when she's saying, Laura, we're not dealing with these issues in isolation. 
There's a postural retreat. She's moving back in a way from the other person, elevated hand, which I think is this just a desire to continue speaking. It shows a little bit of deference. And when Greg and Mark were just talking about the breathing increase or we breathe faster and up more into our chest when we're stressed out. So they're talking about stress here. And right here in the shift to political uh, agreement language, we're going to see there. There's a lot of things that are said that are obviously happening to get people to agree. So I'm just going to say a whole bunch of stuff that's happening right now. And people are going to be like, oh, that's true. That's true. That's true. And then tack something on at the end of it. It's an ancient technique from who knows when. Mark could probably tell you and then the 17 Shakespeare plays that this appeared in. I don't know. But I do know that it's extremely effective. As simplistic and ridiculously simple as it is, it's still very effective at getting us to say, well, the first three things were true. And subconsciously, we'll think, oh, well, the next one is following along. So that makes sense, too. It's a highly effective argument, highly effective technique, I'll say. Scott, what do you got? All right. Her posture has changed completely here. I think this is where she's defeated. She's showing everything that says that her brain is in defense mode, not fight or flight, freeze, fight or flight. She's in, she's just defending herself at this point. I think she's, her legs are closer together. Her arms are closer together. Everything's tightened up on her. She's not moving much. The movements are really, are really slow when there are movements. Her, um, her blink rate is going so fast. I, I, I bet it's, you could hear it humming. If you got real close to her, you could hear a humming sound like hummingbird wings or something. It's going so fast. And um, her cadence slows down. Her voice gets really weak. She's at this point, I think she's, she's defeated. And we get the impression that she's still being open-ended uh, or, or still being open by the way she's trying to talk, but that's not working for her as well either. So I think at this point she's, I'm trying not to cover the same things you guys have talked about, but I think she's just at this point lost. I, I, I think she's been beaten down at this point. She couldn't do it. And a leader is supposed to be able to, to come up, rise up and get above that and at least attack back. If you're not going to get up and leave at the beginning, uh, like I was talking about. All right, let's throw it around the room real quick and in 30 seconds or less, see what we think we've been looking at here. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, interesting battle there that I don't think she won in the end because she really is on the back foot there. Big piece of ideology, no real detail, just one tactic, which is 45 pence. And so uh, no wonder there was uh, a U-turn on this um, just a few days or a day afterwards. Chase, what do you think? I think it's a recipe for disaster. You have a politician who makes the biggest mistake of all politicians, which is pretending to be perfect. We, all people like people who aren't perfect. We have a reporter that has a strong narrative. We hate people with narratives. Look at Joe Rogan. We love the people that are real, don't pretend to be perfect, don't have a narrative. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is one of those situations, and regardless of which country you're in, you're always going to have opposition. And when a person steps up to the plate, they're going to have the heat for whatever happened before them. doesn't matter how they got there, and they're going to have to try to keep at least as many people as happy happy as they can be without getting fired. One of the best things you can do when you're a politician is not to step into the narrative trap. Did you, will you, are you, can you, have you? Yes. Then no matter what you say after that, it's all just fuel for the fire. And she does pick up closer to the end, but I think it's a little bit late and she's already gotten that stress. Scott, you talked about it not being full-blown fight or flight. Guys, when we talk about fight or flight, we're not talking about the kind of terror that you feel when wolves are attacking you. But every little subtle bit of that amygdala recognizing a threat still has an impact. And those same chemicals in different degrees still affect your body. You just don't get to, to the point where you collapse and fail because of it. And so we all are going to have, we have to fight the animal while we're trying to keep the thinking person on top of it. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think what we're seeing is, um, a prime minister who is slowly being deflated. If you watch these videos, just scooch through each one of them. You'll see her just getting lower and lower and just getting quieter and quieter as she goes along. The more she fights, the worse it gets for her because I don't think she knows how to fight. And I think it's just, it's, I don't want to say it's sad, 
But I felt kind of sorry for her because she really didn't, she couldn't fight her way out of that. She couldn't come on strong and be like, hey, you know, it was, it was I think we just saw her get deflated slowly but surely along in there. All right. Well, I think this is a good one, fellas, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?